All right. Well, uh, thanks for having me back. Looks like there's about twice as many people today as there were last time I was here. So, um, but now, so uh, Ishan asked me to talk about um, something in hepatology. So. Uh, I chose to talk today about cirrhotic ascites and some of the complications associated with this. Um, the reason I chose that, we'll, we'll, you'll see quite clearly, I think. But um, before I start, I just want to say thanks to Dr. Marsano. Um, those of you who haven't met him, this is a, apparently a picture from his high school yearbook. Um, I don't read much Spanish, but uh, he went by the name Tufi, apparently, when he was in high school. So if you're ever on service with him, um, call him Tufi and see what happens. Uh, it was a, it apparently was in a band and was a lover of music, uh, according to that. So anyways, the reason I chose to talk about this, um, particularly about ascites, is because um, it's very common in patients with cirrhosis. In fact, 50% of patients that have compensative cirrhosis at the time of diagnosis go on to develop ascites within 10 years of, of their initial diagnosis. Uh, it's also the most common reason for hospitalization in patients uh, with cirrhosis. You've probably seen that on the wards and certainly on our service over at Jewish. Um, and the real reason is because it has a direct impact on the patient's survival. So you can see um, probability of survival declines uh, quite dramatically the longer patients have uh, ascites. So it really has a significant impact on their overall mortality. Um, I just wanted to review the pathophysiology, and this is important because I, I know for the longest time I always thought that cirrhosis and ascites was, uh, or ascites and cirrhosis was just directly related to their low albumin, and that explained everything. And actually, that really has a very low um, uh, part in, in, in the physiology of, of uh, cirrhotic ascites. So, so basically, the, the, the real player here is the development of portal hypertension. So as you go along the spectrum of development of liver disease, you have inflammation, fibrosis, and then develop of cirrhosis, you eventually develop portal hypertension. And the side effect of that is that you have splanchnic vasodilation. Uh, so all the blood is sort of pooling in the splanchnic system, and this causes two things. One is an increase in the splanchnic pressure, and that develops, because of that, you develop lymphatic, uh, increased lymphatic pressure and lymph formation, which contributes directly to ascites. And the big, the big player here is the arterial underfilling. So you basically have an effective um, arterial hypovolemia, and this causes activation of the RAS system, vasoconstrictors, uh, and this it directly impacts sodium retention. And sodium retention, remember, wherever sodium goes, water follows. And that's what causes volume retention and development of ascites. So it's important. And you know, nowhere on here is, is hypoalbuminemia listed. So it does have a minor impact, but, but really it's, it's the splanchnic vasodilation and activation of the RAS system that really drives formation of ascites in these patients. Mm -hmm. um, so who do we need to do before we talk about ascites and how we, we work it up and treat it? How do we diagnose a patient with cirrhotic ascites. Um, so an indication for diagnostic paracentesis, and this is basically for a patient that we, we're assuming this patient already has cirrhosis. So any patient with cirrhosis that comes into the emergency room or the hospital, they automatically have earned themselves a paracentesis. Uh, certainly if they have local signs, if you see them in clinic, they have local signs of peritonitis, uh, abdominal pain, tenderness, vomiting. Uh, any systemic signs of infection, obviously think about SBP as one of the, the causes of infection in a cirrhotic. Uh, if they have unexplained uh, development of hepatic encephalopathy, new onset renal failure, or worsening of liver, liver function, all those are reasons are to, to do a paracentesis on a patient with cirrhosis. Now, any patient that develops ascites, so if, if they don't have a diagnosis of cirrhosis, if they have moderate to large volume new onset ascites, they're obviously going to need a paracentesis to figure out why they have ascites. Um, proper technique, I'm sure you guys uh, have, have done a fair amount of, of paracentesis. Um, I don't know how it's taught now, but really the, the best way, the best site to access um, acidic fluid is in the left lower quadrant. Uh, so two finger breaths, cephalad to your iliac crest, and then two finger breaths um, medial to that is really your ideal location. Um, you can go midline between the symphysis pubis and the umbilicus. Um, the, the problem is now is a lot of our patients are obese, so there's a big fat pad there. You have to go through a lot of, of tissue before you reach the peritoneum. And then the right lower quadrant is also uh, an acceptable area. The problem is sometimes these patients have dilated cecums, particularly if they're on lactulose. Um, and the, the, the cecal wall is the thinnest part of your colon, so your risk of perforation there uh, is a little bit higher. So I, I typically try to do left lower quadrant unless there's some reason. If they have massive splenomegaly uh, or, or some other reason you can't do it there. Always look for, for superficial venous collaterals before you stick your needle. Um, the risk of bleeding is very low in these patients, but if, certainly if you hit a, a, super, a big superficial vessel, that can cause trouble. Um, 
For a diagnostic peritonitis, you can usually use a 21 or 22 gauge needle. Usually an inch and a half will get into the peritoneum on most people. Uh, you may need a little bit larger needle if you've got a, a very obese person. Sometimes even a spinal needle is necessary. Um, but you don't have to use, one of our fellows was actually trained at another institution to use the, the full paracentesis kit to do a diagnostic paracentesis. So they inserted the large trocar uh, just to do a diagnostic paracentesis. You don't need to do that. Um, the problem with that is you have to make a skin nick with the scalpel that increases your risk of bleeding and increases your risk of development of a, a fistula there. So we don't, you don't need to do that. You just need a small gauge needle and, and about 50 cc's of fluid to do a diagnostic paracentesis. Um, what's your INR cutoff for, for paracentesis, diagnostic or therapeutic? Not, not, not radiology, but what's, what's your, uh, on the wards, what's your uh, cutoff for? Yeah, so there, is, there really is one, isn't one. If you look at the ASLD uh, guidelines, they, they talk about a study. They looked at 1,100 patients that had cirrhosis, underwent a large volume par paracentesis, uh, INRs were as high as eight and a half, platelets were as low as 20,000, and there was not one significant uh, episode of, of bleeding from, from that. So the, the risk of bleeding, even if with an elevated INR, is very, very low. Um, so when you try, if you try to get these scheduled under IR guidance, they'll want their INR less than 1.7 if you're doing it on the, at bedside on the ward, particularly a diagnostic. Don't, don't even worry about their INR or their platelets, really, unless they're 4,000. Um, so now you've done your, your uh, paracentesis correctly, you've uh, aspirated some fluid and you want to send that off for appropriate studies. So uh, what do we need to send? Um, so the routine things we're always going to check is going to be a cell count with differential, an albumin and a total protein. And we use those because we want to calculate a SAG, which is a serum uh, ascites albumin gradient. Uh, usually we are going to do cultures, so you're going to, and the important thing is to inoculate your cultures at bedside, so have your bedside, your uh, culture bottles there at bedside ready to do that. Um, things that are routinely done but it really aren't very helpful are glucose and LDH. I usually don't do those. Um, I don't find that they're very helpful. Gram stain is notoriously um, unhelpful in, in patients with cirrhosis, but usually we do that as well. Um, again, we're, we're assuming that we've, we've got a patient that has, we know they have cirrhosis. These are the routine things we're going to do, cell count, albumin, total protein. Now, if you're assessing someone with, with new onset ascites, it's a little bit different. And there's two ways to approach this. One is to, again, just do your routine things because common things being common, cirrhosis is probably going to be the cause of their ascites. Uh, the other is to do the, the full shotgun of all your other tests. So you can look for mycobacterium, you can do cytology and triglycerides and all those things. But unless you have a good suspicion that they have, they have peritoneal TB or peritoneal carcinomatosis, um, usually those things are low yield. So, and if you find their, their total protein comes back really high and their SAG is really low, it's not cirrhotic, then you can go back and do some of these other things. But um, usually you just kind of start with the simple things first. So again, the reason that the total protein and the albumin are probably the, the two single most important things to get, uh, particularly with new onset ascites, is so we can calculate a SAG, which is our serum albumin ascites gradient. So a gradient greater than 1.1, a high gradient is consistent with portal hypertension in 97% of the cases. Um, and within portal hypertension, usually it's either cirrhosis or cardiac failure are the causes of that. And then we can use our total protein to help differentiate between those two. So here's just a little um, uh, table showing high gradient versus low gradient. Um, peritoneal carcinomatosis and TB being the ones you really don't want to miss with low gradient. Uh, and then cirrhosis and heart failure being the most common with, with high grade. Also think about Bud Chiari and acute onset ascites um, or portal vein thrombosis. Uh, so what, what are these, these patients that have uncomplicated cirrhotic ascites, what does their ascites usually look like? So typically they have a low PMN count, their SAG as we said is high, their ascites to plasma LDH is low, and their total protein is usually less than 2.5, and that's what help us, helps separate us between uh, cardiac ascites. So how do we treat these patients? Uh, well, the first thing is to treat their underlying disease, particularly if they have alcoholic uh, cirrhosis and ascites. They actually can really uh, improve their, uh, over lot, their, uh, their overall condition by abstinence. And in fact, they may even recompensate to some degree. Um, sodium restriction is very important. So usually we put these patients on, this says 250 to 1 milligram or 1,000 milligrams. That's extremely um, uh, it's almost impossible to do that, 250 milligrams of sodium. Uh, usually it's a two gram sodium diet is what we typically do on the wards and as an outpatient. Um, as far as diuretics, why do we, so what's the, what's the single most important medication that we use in patients with uh, uh, cirrhotic ascites? If you only had to choose one medicine, what would it be? 
So I say aldactone? Right, aldactone. Um, and the reason, so you see a, a graph here, diuretic response in patients, because it's comparing uh, spironolactone versus furuzamide. Uh, and you can see the diuretic response is significantly greater um, in patients that are on spironolactone versus Lasix alone. Now, usually we use these two in conjunction, but the reason spironolactone, as we saw in that initial graph, is so important is because we're, we're directly impacting the RAS system, which is our, our major mechanism of action here. Um, so it is superior in, in single, um, single doses, it's superior to furosemide, but we usually use the two of them together. So diuretic titration, we usually start um, unless their sodium is extremely low or they're hypotensive, we usually start with 100 milligrams of aldactone and 40 milligrams of Lasix. Um, we double their dose every three to four days, and we usually use their serum um, sodium potassium or their urine sodium potassium potassium ratio uh, to guide our titration of, of diuresis and their weight loss. And we'll talk about the spot urine potassium sodium ratio in just a second. Um, you're obviously going to be checking their urine light serum creatinine very closely during this. Then the goal is to lose about a pound a day if they don't have edema, and about two pounds a day if they do have edema. So it's important to make sure, just like you do a CHF patient, make sure these patients are doing daily weights. Um, if they're losing three, four pounds a day, then you probably need to cut back a little bit on their diuretics. So this is a study from hepatology from 2002. They looked at um, diuretic response measuring urine, potassium, and sodium. Um, they did a 24-hour collection and they just did a spot collection about 23 and a half hours after their initiation of their administration of their diuretic dose. Uh, and they found that the spot um, urine sodium potassium ratio was just as good as a 24 hour. And it actually, it, it really shows um, a, a good uh, estimation of response to diuretics. You can see um, here if their sodium potassium ratio is greater than one 24 hours after diuretics, their diuretic response is upwards of 90%. Um, and if it's less than that, then they typically means they're not responding. You need to increase your dose if they're gonna tolerate that. Um, Let's see, and this was just a single, this is a single AM dose of spironolactone and, and uh, furosemide. So uh, again, we talked about their weight goal um, using their sodium potassium ratio. Uh, and it, the reason that's important is if your ratio is greater than one, then that means that almost 90% of those patients are excreting more than 88 milliequivalents a day of sodium. And that's what you need to maintain at least a, a, a an equivalent balance, if not get into a negative sodium balance, and that's how you uh, you lose weight and lose um, your your fluid when you have ascites. Uh, the other thing that's been studied is a, so we always talk about doing the timing of your spot uh, potassium sodium potassium ratio, and sometimes it's very difficult on the wards to time this appropriately. Um, nurses will forget to do it in the morning, or you'll forget to order it. So I've also, also looked at doing a random spot, and if that if you do that in your ratio. Um, is greater than 3.5, then there's a very high predictive, positive predictive value that you're still going to have a good response to diuretics. So you can still do a sort of a random one if you want, but it's not uh, recommended though. Uh, and the reason we use spironolactone, um, again, is because it affects, it affects the RAS system. Um, it's more effective than loop, loop diuretics. The things you really want to watch out for are hyperkalemia, which is the most common side effect of aldactone, acidosis. Uh, and a lot of times your patients will come in complaining of uh, increase in breast tissue or painless gynecomastia. That's not an indication to stop the medication unless it becomes very painful. Um, then you're, you're really stuck with either using uh, Lasix alone or you can try to add amiloride, but it's, it's not very good. Um, we don't use it very often. And again, your doses are done, you're doubling your doses as you're doing this. So it's 100 to 200, 200 to 400. 400 is usually about your maximum dose. Uh, Lasix, uh, as you know, hypokalemia um, is the most common side effect. Uh, alkalosis, doses 40, 80, or 160. It's interesting if you look at the, and I encourage you all to read the ASLD guidelines as well as the EASL. So EASL is a European study for liver disease. ASLD is the American uh, society, and they both have guidelines on, on ascites and cirrhosis. And they're both very good. There's some subtle differences, and one is the Europeans don't use Lasix um, initially. They just start with aldactone. Um, and I've talked to Marsano about this before, and his, his experience has been in the patients that he just puts them on aldactone, they almost always end up on Lasix again at some point. And one of the main reasons is because you're trying to counteract the hyperkalemia associated with aldactone. So here in, in the U.S., and particularly uh, in this institution, we always start these medications concomitantly. Um, metalazone, again, we don't use this very often. You can add it as sort of a third agent when you've maxed out your, your diuretic therapy. 
uh, as long as your MAP is high, um, the major side effect of that is hypokalemia. Uh, water restriction, typically we don't institute this until their sodium drops to about 125 milli equivalents. That's when you start to get concerned about hyponatremia um, and you may need to restrict them. So usually it's about a liter to a liter and a half. Uh, make sure you're aggressively correcting malnutrition in these patients. So the thing we always write for when we, our, our cirrhotics come in, they need meals, three meals a day, they need three snacks a day, and they should always get supplements, particularly in the evening, because they lose most of their muscle mass at night. So the most important time for them to get their nutrition supplements like Booster Insure is right before they go to bed. Uh, make sure they're getting adequate protein and, and calories. So a uh, dietary consult is, is often appropriate for these patients. Um, so hyponatremia, this is probably the most common side effect of diuretic therapy uh, and is what oftentimes um, requires us to stop or, or temporary hold, uh, temporarily hold, hold diuretic therapy. So again, make sure you're checking BMP pretty, pretty frequently on these patients in the early course of therapy. Uh, the first line of treatment for hyponatremia is fluid restriction. So when you get to about 120, 127 or so, you start thinking about that. Um, and then you may need to actually uh, temporarily hold their diuretics if their sodium gets below about 125. It depends on the, the U.S. guidelines are a little more um, liberal. They, they'll let sodium go down to about 120. The European guidelines are about 125 and they start holding it. So if you fluid restricted the patient, you've held their diuretics and they're still developing hyponatremia, um, then we start talking about the role of medical therapy. And um, so the Vaptens have been used a little bit in cirrhosis and uh, and, and other things, um, polycystic kidney disease, you've also heard of Conovaptin. Well, the, the oral form of this is called Tolvaptin or SAMSCA. Um, and we've used this quite a bit in our cirrhotics and generally it's been very safe. Uh, the dose is uh, 15 or 30 milligrams. It's usually daily. You can give it for uh, a single one-off dose. You can do it for a week or even up to a month, but we usually don't continue it for longer than that. Um, more recently though, it's been given a black box warning, uh, and the black box, black box warning was actually issued for patients with, li with liver disease. So despite that, uh, we're still using this um, pretty frequently uh, for patients that have um, hyponatremia that's not responsive to sort of uh, our, our usual uh, conservative therapy. And when you do this, make sure that you try to liberalize their fluid restriction. So you don't want them on a one liter fluid restriction and, and also on SAMSCA, because then their sodium is going to go up to 135 uh, very quickly. And the, really the important thing to remember with cirrhotics is they actually tolerate hyponatremia very well. Um, and they'll come into our, our clinics, we'll have a, a, a BMP and their sodium comes back at 112 and they, they look fantastic. So they actually do very well uh, with, and now that doesn't mean they don't need to be admitted to the hospital, but they're, they're not, they don't really have to go to the ICU and get hypertonic saline like some of our other patients. Um, so symptoms are actually quite rare in these patients until their sodium gets below about 110. And that's just due to the chronicity of their disease. Um, so how do we manage patients that, that aren't responding to uh, maximal dose of diuretic therapy? And we term that we give this the term refractory ascites. Uh, and there's really two sort of two subgroups of this, and we don't use this terminology a lot here, but I actually quite like it. One is called diuretic resistant ascites. So that means you have this patient maxed out on on um, spironolactone, max out on Lasix, you maybe even added metolazone, and they're still accumulating ascites. Uh, you've got them on a two gram sodium diet, their urine sodium potassium ratio just can't get to where it needs to be, and they swear that they're compliant with their, their sodium diet. So that's called diuretic resistant ascites. The other subgroup is called diuretic intractable ascites. So this is the patient that develops hyponatremia or hyperkalemia or hypokalemia, or some reason, hypotension, they can't tolerate the diuretics. So you may even have, you may only have them on a low dose, but they just can't tolerate the diuretic anymore. So that's called diuretic intractable ascites. But both of those patients go on to develop refractory ascites, and they're a very difficult group for us to deal with. Um, and there's some other things they talk about, the duration of treatment. Um, so you have to be on intensive diuretic therapy for at least a week before you can start using these terms. Um, so this is when we start talking about large volume paracentesis or therapeutic paracentesis, and this is done with uh, stable cirrhosis with or without edema. Um, so if you only take off about four to six liters, there's no good data that you have to infuse these patients with colloid. Um, we use the albumin after we do about so five liters is what we typically say in the guidelines. So above five liters, we need to talk about giving colloid infusion, uh, and albumin is our preferred um, agent. So usually it's six to eight grams per liter removed. And, and I, I get asked this question sometimes, and I don't know the right answer, but some pe people ask, do you do that? For every liter above the five liters that you took off, or do you do it for every liter that you took off? And I typically say just do it for every liter that you took off. 
Um, so if you took off six liters, it doesn't really make much sense to only give six grams of albumin. So you just do six times eight and give 50 grams of albumin. So do it for your entire volume removed. Um, they've also studied dextran, which um, is better than placebo, but not quite good, as good as, um, as albumin. And mitodrine has also been shown to improve um, uh, the risk or decrease the risk of HRS after um, a large volume paracentesis. So the reason albumin is really important is because there's something called a post paracentesis circulatory dis dysfunction, and this is what ultimately can lead to hepatorenal syndrome. And this is why we give albumin is to prevent uh, this this from happening. So this is basically due to the accentuation of arterial vasodilation. So these patients, as we talked about earlier, they already already have a uh, arterial vasodilation, systemic arterial vasodilation, and this large volume paracentesis just basically accentu accentuates that. Um, they can get rapid reaccumulation of ascites. There's a 20% risk of HRS or clinically significant hyponatremia when you develop this uh, PPCD, and there's also an increase in your hepatic um, vein pressure gradient, so your portal pressures go up, uh, and that's due to the compensatory um, increase in circulating vasoconstrictors. Basically, overall, what happens is you have an increase in your mortality uh, after LVP if you don't give albumin. And it reduces the risk of, of circulatory dysfunction from 70% down to about 15%. And there was a study comparing this versus um, dextran and, and uh, polygeline, which is like a hexa starch, and uh, albumin was, was far superior. So they only got down to about 35%. Uh, this is a study, this was a pilot study that went on to get published later from uh, the study of mitodrine for cirrhosis. Um, ascites, refractory or recurrent ascites. So they um, studied uh, urine volume and sodium excretion, which both increased after administration of mitodrine. And this is a fairly low dose that they use. So if you guys have been with us on service at Jewish, we know, you know we usually start about 10 and go up to 20 TID. Um, so it'd be very interesting to see what these numbers look like with sort of our standard doses of mitodrine. But uh, mitodrine is helpful in, in patients with refractory and recurrent ascites. Um, it also in, improved their cardiac output, um, or sorry, decreased their cardiac output, um, improved their MAPs. Ma and again, MAP or their hypotension is one of the big reasons that we're, we don't, we're not able to titrate diuretics any further, so that can help with that. Uh, and their systemic vascular resistance also improved. Um, two other medicines that we, we talk about a lot when we talk about uh, refractory ascites, uh, one is beta blockers. So a lot of our patients with cirrhosis that have had variceal bleeding or have had varices uh, which are on primary prophylaxis, they're on beta blockers, non-selective beta blockers. And there's been a lot of data come out in the last five to ten years about an increase in mortality associated with patients that have refractory ascites. So not not well compensated cirrhosis with minimal ascites, but patients that have, have uh, diuretic resistant or intractable ascites. Um, and this is one of the, the studies from 2010 showing uh, a significant um, decrease in overall survival on patients with, with uh, non-selective beta blockers. Um, there was another study just published in the last six months or so basically um, corroborating that and also showing an increased risk in patients that have SBP uh, even without refractory ascites. So patients with refractory ascites or have had SBP, you need to think about stopping their non-selective beta blockers because they're at least we think there's an increased risk of mortality. Now there's a paper that's going to be published in the next two weeks in gut. Uh, we haven't seen the full paper yet, but the abstract suggests that patients that are on the transplant list, uh, even if they have refractory ascites, they actually do better on non-selective beta blockers. So that, that may change our, our thought process a little bit, but we're still waiting to see the data on that. Uh, the other medicine is uh, Trintol or pentoxifiline. You know, we like to use this in uh, a lot of our cirrhotics, uh, even if they don't have acute alcoholic hepatitis. Um, and there's actually pretty good data that it's renal protective in patients that have uh, refractory ascites, so it decreases the risk of developing uh, hepatorenal syndrome through mechanisms we don't quite understand. But um, if you have a patient that has a, um, a low creatinine clearance and they have a large volume ascites, think about um, Trintol as adjunct therapy. Uh, the other is uh, SBP prophylaxis. Uh, with norfloxacin, so these, re this is regardless of your, your total protein uh, in your ascites. This is patients that have um, basically a high child's pew score, so their bilirubin greater than 3, creatinine greater than 1.2, or hyponatremia. Uh, they actually do better on um, quinolone therapy with, with regards to prevention of HRS than patients that aren't on quinolones. Um, so think about uh, antibiotic therapy as well for these patients.
Um, so we have a patient, they're, they're consistently undergoing large volume paracentesis, um, they have rapid reaccumulation of their ascites, they're not amenable to diuretic therapy for whatever reason. Um, so our, our really our last ditch option besides liver transplantation is a TIPS. Um, which is a transjugular uh, intrahepatic portal systemic shunt. Um, you guys may have, if you've been on service with this, a lot of our patients have tips for whatever reason, uh, whether it's for variceal bleeding or refractory ascites or hepatic hydrothorax. But this is a, a pretty good um, therapy for refractory ascites. Uh, it does carry some risks, though, as we'll talk about here. Um, and the, the data actually has kind of gone back and forth, but some of the newer data has been more impressive. This is a few multicenter RCTs, and, and basically what's important here is looking at survival um, in TIPS versus LVP. And you can see that they really swing both ways here. This one from Lebrec, uh, I don't remember when this was published, but the survival in TIPS patients was 30% compared to 60% in, in large volume paracentesis. And then the most recent one in about 2012 that actually swung the complete opposite. So the 60% is in the patients with TIPS and 30% in patients with LVP. Um, a lot of that's based on selection bias in the patients in, in the studies. Um, other thing is, is um, so complications uh, associated with TIPS. Um, so PSE or portal systemic encephalopathy uh, it increases dramatically. The risk of that irreversible PSE increases dramatically in patient with, with TIPS. Uh, but ascites, ascites typically does better uh, in patients with TIPS compared to large volume paracentesis. As you would expect, you're just sort of um, temporarily treating them with LVP. So this is um, data on the effects of TIPS with regards to urinary sodium excretion and serum creatinine. So you can see there's a, over time, there's a dramatic increase in your urinary sodium excre excretion, uh, which is the, the main mechanism for formation uh, of ascites is the lack of sodium excretion. So that improves your, your ascites overall and actually has a beneficial effect on your serum creatinine. So almost a 50% reduction in serum creatinine after six months in patients that have undergone TIPS. Uh, and then again, remember the, the, the real reason behind all this is, is the, the RAS system. And so Rena, we look, they looked at renin, and aldosterone and, and noradrenaline, uh, and all of those um, uh, proteins came down in, in the setting of a, a TIP. So after uh, two to six months, there were dramatic differences in their um, pre and post TIPS levels of these. Uh, cardiac output typically improves initially, uh, and then we'll sort of come back to sort of pre-TIPS baseline after about six months or so. Um, the, the biggest uh, timing of, of, of increases shortly after TIPS, and basically that's just because you're, you're now infusing all of this portal volume directly into your right heart. So as you would expect, your cardiac output, unless they have uh, significant heart failure, is going to go up uh, to compensate for that increased volume. And then uh, nutrition. So everything, most, most everything from a nutrition standpoint also improves with TIPS. So their weight gets better, their muscle mass improves, their energy intake and their resting in energy expenditure uh, all go up and their fat mass goes down, which is exactly what you want to see in patients with cirrhosis. Uh, so this is a landmark study with uh, regards to the MELD score. So you know we use the MELD to stratify patients for transplantation, but it was actually developed for assessment of post-TIPS mortality. And this is the study from 2000. Um, and they. They divided these patients into alcoholic and cholestatic uh, uh, cirrhosis versus other forms of cirrhosis. And this sort of still holds true today that, that basically alcoholic cirrhotics typically will tolerate a higher meld uh, with a TIPS and, and do better. So when we talk about our threshold for TIPS in patients with variceal bleeding or refractory ascites, we usually say about 15 or so. But if they're alcoholic cirrhotic, um, they, we may be able to push that up to about 18 or 20, and, and they still do okay. So it's important to know the etiology of their cirrhosis. Um, but you can see, I mean, in general, basically, as your MELD increases, your risk of mortality increases. Um, so contraindications for TIPS, uh, severe CHF, particularly right heart failure. Again, remember, you're going you're to be bypassing all of the portal flow from the liver directly into the IVC. So if they already have right heart failure, they're not going to tolerate that, and it's not going to change their portal pressures. Uh, same thing with severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, if they have polycystic liver disease or severe hepatic failure uh, or portal vein thrombosis with cavernoma. So that means it's a chronic portal vein thrombosis. Uh, relative contraindications or active infection, um, PSEs, so the uh, encephalopathy can, can become much more pronounced after a uh, TIPS. Uh, 
And there's been a few cases where we've had to go back in and actually include the tips because they have irreversible uh, encephalopathy. So always explain that to a patient if you're, you know, you're talking, obviously you guys aren't going to be talking to them really about tips, but it's just something to know as a potential side effect. Um, and then, you, so again, portal vein thrombosis without cavernoma depends on your radiologist. Uh, the guys at Jewish are very aggressive and um, there's very little that will prevent them from doing a tips, uh, again, unless it's a chronic portal vein thrombosis. So this is just sort of summing up the easel guidelines, um, which are very good. I actually quite like these. Uh, repeat LVP plus albumin um, is first line therapy for uh, refractory ascites. Um, if your urinary sodium excretion um, does not, if you're not getting above 30 millimoles per day, you can probably stop your diuretics because you're, you're not going to get to a point where uh, th these patients are actually going to be responsive. And then you're, you don't have to worry about uh, azotemia and HRS and things like that. Um, so TIPS is effective in the management of refractory ascites, but it does have a high risk of, of reversible encephalopathy, um, and it's not convincing that it, the, the survival is, is that much better than um, large volume paracentesis. So consider TIPS when patients have frequent LVP requirements um, or in those who paras paracentesis have infected. So sometimes patients will have loculated ascites that's very difficult to get to. You can only get small amounts out even though they have, you know, they have a large amount in there. Um, so that's very frustrating for the patient, it's frustrating for us or the radiologist. So those may be patients that you might think about doing a TIPS in. Uh, after TIPS, so remember I showed you the graph about urinary sodium excretion. It takes a little bit of time for that to reach maximal levels. So the, the resolution of ascites is slow, it doesn't happen overnight. So they're probably still going to need diuretic therapy for, for a period of time. Um, if their melt is about 15 or 18, use caution. If there's an alcoholic cirrhotic, you may be able to get away with that. Uh, performed only in the absence of other options, and then we talked about uh, contraindications. So if we kind of go back to that, that picture I showed you at the beginning, we can kind of put together all the things we talked about to some degree um, and, and where these things actually work on, on this, um, this graph here. So, uh, you know, again, the general things that we're doing with the CITES, we're talking about um, low sodium intake, use of diuretic therapy, uh, and particularly spironolactone, we're, we're affecting the activation of the, uh, the RAS system. Um, when we do do paracentesis, we always need to use a plasma expander, preferentially albumin. Um, so vasoconstrictor therapy like mitadrine has been shown to be uh, effective as well. Um, if patients develop hyponatremia, we can use V2 receptor antagonists to help um, combat that to some degree. Uh, but a subset of these patients still will not respond to these things, and we talk about tips and eventually liver transplantation if, if they're a candidate for that. And that's really ultimately what they need is liver transplant. So uh, a few uh, slides on complications of ascites. Um, so obviously SVP is our, our biggest concern, is what we see most commonly. Um, there's two terms that we use, uh, SVP and CNNA, and we'll talk about the difference of that. Uh, in a second, we kind of use them interchangeably. Um, prevalence, though, is pretty high, 10 to 27 percent of patients in a hospital. Uh, so that's why we always need to tap our cirrhotics when they come into the hospital. Um, pathogenesis is, can be either distant bacteremia, so they may have a UTI or a URI, or they can just have translocation from the bacteria. Uh, so we know about leaky gut in, in patients with cirrhosis, and that may be the pathogenesis, pathogenesis in a lot of these patients. Um, as far as signs and symptoms, they're very nonspecific. So as you see, only 50% uh, of patients actually have abdominal pain when they have SBP based on their uh, ascites uh, serologies. Um, encephalopathy may be a presenting uh, complaint. Um, leukocytosis is probably the, the most um, sensitive of these or specific, uh, but it's not always seen. Neither is fever, and rebound is very rarely seen in, in SBP. So we, di we diagnose SVP if they have a PMN count greater than 250 um, with 90% uh, monobacterial. Uh, other predictors for SVP are their white blood cell count, uh, their acidic white blood cell count greater than 1,000. Um, ascites pH less than 7.35, we don't typically check that. Or a blood, as blood ascites pH gradient either. So the, the term CNNA basically is elevated PMNs without a positive culture. Um, and as you guys have probably seen, and I know my experience has been that very rarely do we get a positive culture from these patients. Um, and I think the reason is probably because most of the patients, by the time we get to them and do a paracentesis, they have already gotten antibiotic therapy for something. It only takes one dose of an appropriate antibiotic to, to give you a negative culture. So I think the reason we don't see a lot of 
uh, true SBP is because they've already been given prophylactic antibiotics. So we, the, the, the real term, if we wanted to be uh, specific, it would be culture negative neutrocytic ascites if they have P elevated PMNs with a negative culture. Um, so other things that can cause that besides antibiotics are uh, bleeding, cancer, TB, and pancreatitis. Uh, as far as the bacteriology, as you would expect, gram-negative bacilli are far and away the most common, and that, that corresponds to coverage that we typically use in these patients. So E. coli and Klebsiella, um, gram-positives are less common. If you do have them, usually it's a strep species or enterococcus, and then anaerobes are even less common. Um, again, this is uh, the importance of doing blood culture at bedside rather than sending a tube down for the lab to do a culture and plate. So your, your chance of getting a positive culture is significantly higher if you do it appropriately by, by bedside culture. Um, this is a, a slide showing um, uh, use of norfloxacin daily in patients that have uh, a low um, total protein. So the, the number they've chosen here is one. Some of the other, some guidelines say, uh, is 1.5. Some guidelines say one. So uh, I, we usually use 1.5. If your total protein is less than 1.5, think about um, SPP prophylaxis, primary prophylaxis in these patients. Uh, this is in hospital, though. So once they go home, you don't need to continue their antibiotic unless they've had a previous episode of SPP or if they develop SPP in the hospital. Um, as you'll see throughout the next couple slides, all of these studies were done with norfloxacin. Um, the problem is norfloxacin is not available anymore here. So we're substituting with another quinolone, usually Cipro or Leviquin, whatever's on the hospital formulary. Um, so we're hoping that we can extrapolate the norfloxacin data, but w w there's not been specific studies done with Cipro or, or, um, or Leviquin, but we, we would expect that it should be similar. Um, and then this is the effect of albumin on um, azotemia and mortality in SPP. So again, volume expansion, as we've seen, uh, is important in, in treatment of ascites, but also in patients that have infection, um, it's important. And the, the way we dose this is a little bit different than what we do for ascites. So rather than giving six to eight grams per liter, we're, we're giving 1.5 grams per kilogram on their, their, their day one when we found out they have infection. Uh, and then we give one gram per kilogram three days later. So the, again, this, this data is for SPP. Uh, we've gone now to extrapolate this for any infection in a cirrhotic. So if they come in with pneumonia or a UTI, um, we would expect that they probably should have a similar response with, with this therapy. So make sure you're giving them appropriate levels of albumin if they're infected. Um, so long-term norfloxacin decreases the rate of uh, SPP recurrence, but not mortality. Uh, then the ceftrioxone, so we talked about, I talked about this in the GI bleed lecture I gave a couple weeks ago. Uh, so the, more, the first thing you need to do in a patient with the GI bleed is put them on antibiotics. Uh, it's probably the most important thing uh, for them, even though there's not good data that it decreases hospital um, mortality. So in hospital prophylaxis, again, this is a patient with a total protein of less than 1.5. Norfloxacin, basically we're, we're now using Cipro or Leviquin, Cipro 500 or, or Leviquin 500. Or you can even use Bactrim DS for five days out of the week uh, during their hospitalization. They have a GI bleed, um, Norfloxacin or uh, Cefotaxime was the, um, the drug that was studied in the GI bleed study. We typically use ceftriaxone. And again, a lot of this is just because of hospital substitutions for available drugs, but um, ceftriaxone should be equivalent to cefotaxime. Uh, so this is important to treat these patients appropriately because they have a very high risk of mortality. So without treatment, it's upwards of 100% if you have SPP, untreated SPP. Uh, with appropriate antibiotic therapy, it goes down to 30%, and it reduces the risk of HRS to about 30% as well. Um, and if you add albumin onto that, we're now talking about levels as low as 10%. Uh, the problem is they get recurrent SBP uh, quite often. So treatment um, of, of SBP itself, uh, again, ceftriaxone is our drug of choice in our institutions. Um, you should be using two grams once daily uh, for most of these patients. A lot of times we put, we put them on one gram. That's for sort of prophylactic therapy. But if you know they have SBP, I'd, I'd go ahead and increase their dose to two grams. Uh, there's been some um, suggestion about doing a repeat paracentesis two days afterwards. Don't usually need to do that unless something's just not right with their clinical course. If they're not responding appropriately, uh, if they're still having abdominal pain or fevers, leukocytosis, 
um, you may need to, to do a repeat paracentesis. If you don't see a 25% reduction in their white blood cell count in two days, and you need to broaden your coverage a little bit. So you th start thinking maybe they've got an anaerobe or, or a gram positive or something a little bit unusual. But, but that's not uh, something you routinely need to do. Uh, again, so uh, prophylaxis um, or secondary prophylaxis, uh, again, norfloxacin was a medicine that was studied. Uh, Cipro is, is probably your best alternative, uh, 500 milligrams daily. Uh, the guidelines will actually say you can use 750 weekly, um, but we've sort of gotten away from that. that we think there's a risk of um, resistance when you're giving this intermittent dosing, so we prefer to give Cipro uh, daily rather than weekly. Um, so primary prophylaxis, I mentioned that. Uh, so the, the total protein less than 1.5, primary prophylaxis is for in-hospital stay only. They don't need to go out on, on that. But if you have a patient that has severe liver disease, so their child's Pew score is, uh, is a C, so this is sort of like what we talked about earlier with the CITES in general, this is a, a patient that might benefit from SBP prophylaxis. Um, you can consider this for long-term out-of-hospital prophylaxis, probably with ciprofloxacin. The patients that have moderate liver disease, uh, they, we just don't know about them, so we typically don't do that until they actually develop an episode. Um, monomicrobial bacteriocytes, uh, so this is basically positive culture with low PMNs. We don't see this very often. Um, so this is a, you have to make sure they don't have a surgically treatable source of infection. Um, there's, again, their, their symptoms at presentation are very nonspecific, fever being the most common. Uh, but it's important because they still have a high uh, risk of mortality. And we typically treat these patients, uh, and then we go in and we do a repeat um, uh, paracentesis in 48 hours, and they may actually then show that they have overt SBP, in which case it's easy, we continue their treatment. But if they're doing very well clinically and their PMNs are still very low, uh, we're not really sure what to do with that group of patients. So you, if, they're, if they're really doing well, you may be able to stop antibiotic therapy at that time. So uh, just to summarize the CITES management, you evaluate with the paracentesis, um, azotemia, fever, treat those if necessary, check your protein albumin, white blood cell count in every patient, and do your bedside, your cultures at bedside. Uh, treat with sodium restriction, LVP, and diuretics. Um, if they have SVP, ceftriaxone is our drug of choice with albumin, 1.5 grams on day one, one gram uh, on day two. Um, if their protein is less than 1.5 and they don't have SBP, put them on prophylaxis in the hospital. And if they're bleeding, regardless of whether or not they have SBP, give them ceftriaxone. So the last thing I want to talk about is uh, hepatic hydrothorax and SBE, which is spontaneous bacterial empyema, uh, basically SBP of, of the lung. And we treat that, essentially treat that the same for the most part. So this is a shunt study. I have a picture of a shunt study up here. Uh, you can see the diaphragms quite nicely. Um, here, and then you can see all the tracer that's gone up into the lung. So this is a nuclear medicine scan. They inject uh, radio-labeled technetium into the peritoneum, and then they see if it, if it communicates with the, uh, with the pleura. Um, if they have a large volume uh, um, pleural fluid, they, they'll need to do a thoracentesis and reduce that, because you need, you need to have some room for the tracer to get into the pleural cavity. Um, so you may need to ask your radiologist for a, a thoracentesis before you do this. So uh, these are just some things you'll see if you do a thoracentesis and you check your fluid. Um, your protein ratio is, is usually greater than 0.5. Your LDH is uh, greater than two-thirds upper limit. This is usually transudative, just like your, your ascites is. Um, glucose is always greater than 60 uh, milligrams per deciliter in patients with uh, hepatic hydrothorax. Uh, and the LDH ratio is usually greater than 0.6. So er, basically everything is transudative with a high glucose. Um, signs and symptoms of, of SBE, uh, again, nonspecific, uh, just things that suggest they have an infection. Uh, abdominal pain is, is very low, as well as thoracic pain. So um, we diagnose this basically the same way as with uh, SBP. If their culture is positive and they have PMNs greater than 250, or if they have PMNs greater than 500 with a negative culture, then we, we think they have an SBE. Um, bacteria is similar to what we see with uh, SBP, E. coli, Klebsiella, uh, and up to three, uh, two thirds, one sorry, one third of these patients actually have bacteremia. Um, 
So SBP and SBE can coexist, about 50% of the patients. Uh, the important thing is don't put a chest tube in these patients unless they have an actual empyema. Um, or, or pus, I guess pus on the thoracentesis. Uh, so if you do do a chest tube early on these patients, it actually um, can, can increase uh, their mortality. So uh, try to avoid that unless, possible, unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, mortality, as I said, is high. If their cultures are positive, uh, treatment is the same as uh, SBP and response to therapy is usually pretty good. Uh, secondary peritonitis, so this is uh, multiple organisms when you get your culture back. So remember, if you do get a positive culture, it should be uh, a single organism in most cases of SVP. Um, so always think about uh, uh, perforation of a, a viscous if you've got um, multiple organisms. You may need to get surgery involved. Uh, certainly you want to put them on broad spectrum antibiotics rather than just um, uh, cephalosporin. And then this is the last slide here. Uh, two other things to consider. So patients with ascites, particularly large volume ascites, they often develop abdominal wall hernias, uh, most commonly umbilical hernias, uh, seen in up to 20% of patients. There's a risk of strangulation, particularly after we do a large volume paracentesis or with tips. We decompress them, and that's as, as the sort of the peritoneum is shrinking, they can get strangulation of the bowel. Um, so always watch out for that. Um, tell your patients what signs and symptoms to look for if they have an incarceration or strangulation. Uh, encourage use of an abdominal binder that can help sometimes and I mean really the treatment of choice is surgery but you want to try to avoid that in these patients particularly if they've got refractory ascites that means their their child's pew score is probably pretty high and their MELD score is high so they have a high operative mortality for elective surgery so we usually try to, to hold these patients off until they actually get listed and then undergo transplantation and then the surgeons will take care of their hernia uh, at time of transplantation the other thing I wanted to mention briefly, we get consults occasionally for patients with uh, cirrhosis for a peg tube. And uh, cirrhosis itself is not a contraindication, but certainly cirrhosis with ascites is. Um, in fact, there's a very high increase in mortality if you put a peg tube in with somebody that's got ascites. Uh, you basically have a, a continuous um, uh, path to the peritoneum for infection. They leak, they leak ascites around the, the, the G tube. So uh, we try to avoid this at all costs. So, you guys have someone that um, nutrition is an issue and they're cirrhotic with ascites, um, you know, don't even bother asking for a, a PEG tube. We may just need to put an NJ down or, uh, you know, do something different. But PEG tubes just aren't a good idea in these patients. So I think that's it.